Kerbal Space Program. It looks like a game, it smells like a game, it even plays like a game. It's listed as a game, but I don't really think it's a game. More like exhaust fume induced hallucinations, where minions from those terrible illumination movies actually are a productive part of society and not pure brain rot and actually teaches you about science and rocketry? Oh wow, I must be really high. I mean, whatever. First released in 2011, Kerbal was a small little early access project where you build a rocket, often in the shape of a penis, and launch it. Then watch it explode 10 seconds later and call it science. And oddly enough, it actually was. Remember kids, the only difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. And that kind of is the beauty of this tiny little odd seeming game from a decade ago. Kerbal is basically a physics simulator in a clown shoes get up smacking you with a wet fish called science while you're laughing so hard you're learning every detail about it. And I love this game. More than that, I highly respect it. Basically speaking, Kerbal is a true and true physics simulation with some childish aspects. In terms of categories, it falls under the space sims, more specifically space flight simulators. And yes, it must be pronounced in full without abbreviation because it's earned it. And for more information, you can check out my mini history explainers about space sims as a whole. Overall, spaceflight simulators in the past have been very far and few between, mostly because of their difficulty to make. Plus, if you're gonna make a simulation, you might as well do it in full for the industrial approach, without the game part needlessly being attached. But once in a while, somebody is mad enough to create a real-time simulation game. I've mostly stayed away from these true simulators, as I find them dull and boring with increasing necessity to learn that goes beyond even lines levels of spreadsheet humping and data snorting, but Kerbal was different. My adventures in learning what these funky little green men and women could do went a little like this. First, I made a rocket looking thing and proceeded to launch it. Next, you'll learn that liquid and solid rockets don't really mix. So you build a rocket that manages to start. After the first dopamine hit of exhaust fume sniffing, you strap even more rockets on it. For shits and giggles, you decide to build a Beyblade. <laughs> then you think, well, okay, let's build a plane. Slowly, then you start challenging yourself to build even more explosive, stupid, or more importantly, functional rockets. And progressively, you're learning little things, and before you know it, you have established your first orbit and realize, hold on, is learning rocket science fun? Did I just do that? At this point, Kerbal has given you tools, and you on your own have progressed through trial and error to genuinely learn the game and its gameplay. It's one of the hardest things for games to naturally craft progression where the player is not talked down to or shoved into training modes, but through natural gameplay get to learn the ins and outs. See, this is the power of Kerbal. They made science fun! The silly little cartoon Kerbal design is what grabs you and lets you know, hey, Kerbals have only two stats. Courage and stupidity. There are two stats for the Kerbals. Courage and stupidity. <laughs> Just, it's so emblematic of the whole Kerbal. It's, I love it. Stupidity is a stat. Uh, it's a game about science, damn it. <laughs> no, seriously, stupidity is an actual stat bar in Kerbal. So you know not to take the game too seriously at all. But unlike their yellow minion counterparts that rot your brain and decrease your IQ every second you look at them, Kerbals instead uses this silliness to subconsciously teach you. And that's just so cool. A safe and welcoming environment where the game at no point tells you eh, wrong, but instead says 20 high output rockets? Fuck yeah! Let's go! <laughs> oh. 
only encourages you to try all manner of wacky and silly things. And you don't even notice, but in the background you're learning about real rocket science. How cool is that? And I mean it, it's real rocket science. Yes, even though Kerbals are dressed up in these kids-like characters, the parts, mechanics, physics are genuinely representative of real-world counterparts. Kerbal Space Program is a real space flight simulator, but it's also hella fun! They managed to bridge the gap that is so important and hard to do, making boring science stuff meet the entertainment and active learning. And this, this is why it deserves respect, most of all. Now, I do have to mention a few things about the gameplay, because it's not perfect. <laughs> In fact, like most dry spaceflight simulators, uh, there are more things wrong than right. Straight off the bat, how do you even get into this game? First time players, like myself, probably will get frustrated and confused due to the overwhelming amount of options and details with very few transferable skills from other games. So then, tutorial. Well, there isn't one. Yes, this was and still is one of the biggest missing parts of the game. Like me, you probably boot up Kerbal and jump straight into the sandbox mode or play scenarios and that's a recipe for disaster. If you're lucky and you pick up on nuances in the sandbox mode, you will eventually progress just like I showcased. From silly builds to more serious ones, but that's a rare and frankly very slow process. And that was my case. Ah, but yeah, Max, there is a tutorial. It's called training. Oh. Oh, oh, shit. See, that's how easy it is to miss it. In fact, for the review, I started with the career mode, hoping that at least I would get some missions, unlocking stuff, and that will help me progress. Which it did, kind of, but it was still missing a lot of necessary info. So then, training. Oh, well, it opens up with reading. Yay. Welcome back to the world of the living stock. How are you feeling? Right, here's the thing. By the year 2000, we already had voiced characters and games. Fact is, it doesn't take even that much effort to do character voice recordings overall. So games that even to this day refuse to put in extra effort in fully voice acting their games lose a lot of appeal. And not like I'm against reading, but video games are audio-visual interactive medium and reading, especially when you don't condense the words correctly, only hurts the experience. God damn it, my eyes are already glazing over this. Why? Just just starting out your uh, not finish blah blah blah. Oh I hate reading this shit. Oh god damn it. Yep, I was bored out of my mind while reading this nonsense. It became progressively sadder when I lost enthusiasm for literal rockets. While slowly reading small text with literally no visual indicator of any kind of panels, gauges or anything. A simple highlighter would have solved half of these problems and in fact Kerbal 2 addressed this issue spectacularly well. I noted this in my quote unquote review for it when it launched. The tutorial was so nice and welcoming that it alleviated my experience exponentially. So now now doing Kerbal 1 training tutorial with the exact opposite experience is such a shame. However, the training missions at some point started getting better until they clicked and for the first time I got to reach the orbit. It's a magical moment, even though I've done this in Kerbal 2 already, it does not stop being amazing. But honestly, you are better off watching YouTube tutorials rather than playing training missions and all that because of two problems. No voice work and no highlighter. Once you've learned the basics though, the game opens up a lot. There are generally five game modes or ways of playing Kerbal. On YouTube, you probably spotted one of them, the sandbox. Here, everything is unlocked and available with no limitation. This is where you are free to do anything and everything and most likely will end up. Next is career mode. Here you start off with a handful of parts, very limited capabilities, and you can slowly unlock everything as you progress with completing missions or performing science-y tasks. Here you get to feel the progression of the game, or at least uh, some kind of attempt at the progression. Hey Lem, are you- <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> oh god! Oh, sorry about the- Works! Tourism! <laughs>
This game mode puts limitations on you, and it's always fun incrementally improving your characters and facilities, but much like touching a lathe inappropriately, it quickly gets bloodier than strapping a rat to a rocket engine. Because this mode seems to be kind of a quote-unquote afterthought feature, missions you get can often be super meaningless, like testing a heat shield on a landing pad that takes more time, watching the loading screens than doing the test itself, or testing a part with very specific altitude, speeds and other conditions that you simply just don't have the parts unlocked for yet. Basically there is little to no structure for a game design placed on this game mode. It's like, game, give me limitations on random tasks for a challenge. Science mode, on the other hand, does away with reputation, funding, money, upgrading, and only includes the science tech tree unlocks. So it's up to you to perform science experiments to get more parts. Basically a cut down version of a career mode if you want it to be a bit easier. Then there are scenarios and missions. In both, you're tasked to recreate or achieve some kind of a goal. In scenarios, developers have placed all manner of historic and made up, um, scenarios for you to experience with a jump off point. Whee! While well, missions can be divided into two categories, developer made, somewhat structured experiences and player creations. Um, yeah, and similarly, you can too build your own missions for others to yeah. Oh, and no matter what mode you decide to play on, remember, warp time is not your friend when doing launches. Oh, and also, there aren't enough struts in the world to keep this rocket steady enough. But that is not all. Mods, yes, there are mods. And some of them are actually good! Damn, I love PC Master Race gaming, especially the older non-live service, non-microtransaction-laden abominations. So refreshing to just load up a mod that makes the gameplay better, look better, or, um, uh, well, whatever the hell that is. I love it! Now, let's take a little intermission and briefly go over the history of the game. Where the hell did it even come from? Well, for one, Mexico! Yes, I was just as surprised as you! That Kerbal did not include cocaine. The work on Kerbal Space Program started around 2010 when developer Squad, who at the time wasn't even making software, hired Philippe. And the word Kerbal itself came from his childhood when he strapped little tin figurines on fireworks, calling them Kerbals. Ah, how cute! Kerbal Space Program itself was first available for public in early access state in around mid-2011, when early access wasn't as tarnished yet. The game was very rudimentary, and if you know where and how, you still can actually download that very same version and try it out. Gods, it's so refreshing to play a non-life service bullshit. Yay, game preservation! Anyways, in 2013, the alpha version of the game gets added to the Steam and priced around 15 bucks. A year later, the game reaches beta version and the price goes up to 20 bucks. At this point, the game had garnered enough attention to have a spin-off Kerbal Edu version made and have a blessing from NASA for Asteroid Missions Pack. Funnily enough, also Kevin McLeod, you know, the guy whose music you can hear in literally every YouTube video these days, he composed a portion of the game's music too. And by 2015, the game reaches the full release state. They also that year released several console ports, and things for the most part are looking extremely great. And it was. It's incredible that all the complex physics simulations and structure for the game was created in this time frame. Makes you wonder how mismanaged and incompetent modern early access game developers really are. It's a Astonishing. But back to Kerbal. Two years later, with another expansion in the wings, developers announced that they've been acquired by Take Two. Yes, the very same Take Two that pump out NBA 2K games with literal child gambling in it. Not gonna look, not gonna look. This is also where Take-Two creates a subsidiary publisher to handle mid-sized games called Private Division. So remember, even if it's called Private Division, it's still Take-Two. Two years later, in 2019, the game gets another expansion. At this point in Gamescom, it's also announced that Kerbal 2 is being developed by a new unrelated team called Uber Entertainment, later renaming themselves to Star Theory. However, only a year later, Private Division, that is Take 2, announced that they've created a new developer studio called Intercept Games, who will be taking over the development of KSP 2. Oh, and also, Take 2 tried and succeeded poaching a good chunk of Star Theory's developers while pulling the contract 
under them for development of KSP2. A year later, with no surprise, Star Theory shuts down. The good guy take two, am I right? In 2021, Kerbal Space Program received its final expansion, completing the game's lifespan. While it is possible that it could get some kind of an update, all eyes are on Kerbal 2 at this point, and it's doubtful. Overall, Kerbal 1 is a grand success in game development history. It rose from early access and consistently improved, becoming a full game in reasonable time frame, while releasing a few expansions to supplement income and improve the overall experience. To me, this is how a game should be made. Though early access should also be an exception, rather than the norm. Speaking of Kerbal 2, I'll have to bring down the mood a bit here. As of making this, a few months ago, in 2023, Kerbal 2 finally released, and though initially it generated a genuine positive surge in popularity for both of the games, due to unreasonable price, lackluster functionality, and very poor performance, the game was quickly criticized and more so abandoned after the launch. Right now, Kerbal 2 sits at a 250 average players. No, not 1000, just 250. It's shocking to learn, but not quite so shocking after playing it. Feel free to check out my rant on why this is happening, I'll link it down below, but there was one crucial detail I noted, and it pertained to Kerbal 1. See, because of the negative result of the piss poor handling, the negative stink affected both of the games. On Steam, at the day of Kerbal 2 launch, you can see influx on Kerbal 1 as well, but just as Kerbal 2 plummeted, the interest for Kerbal 1 also started drying up. Sure, at the moment, Kerbal 1 sits slightly below 2000 players average, however, before Kerbal 2, it was consistently above 4000 players. And you can't argue with these results. Kerbal 2 ruined the good nature and will the original so diligently grew over a decade. So, I still urge you to try out Kerbal 1 and not abandon it completely. However, I can't blame you for not being able to ignore what Kerbal 2 and Take 2 did. It's the worst situation to be in and all because of corporate attitudes. Same happened to Elite Dangerous 2. So, here we are, Kerbal Space Program. The game has had such an impressive lifespan, but one thing that we tend not to notice is the impact on culture. See, SpaceX, despite being headed by the shit meme lord Elon Hall, is something that's increasingly entertaining and exciting to see progress in the new age of space travel pioneering. And Kerbal is right there to give you fun tools to recreate these events and more. If you got even a sliver of interest in space, space travel, rocketry, or just cool explosions in real life, much like what Midbusters did, the game will no doubt further your grasp on actual real-world applicable skills. I'm not kidding! Just like with Microsoft Flight Simulator or DCS World, if you get proficient with these quote-unquote games, you have a fair chance to actually land a job on these fields. Thanks to science cheerleaders like Kerbal, STEM and other science-based spheres become increasingly entertaining and attractive to all kids of any age. Yes, you, John, even you in your 50s can shamelessly enjoy this. Why not? It's never too late to learn. This is one of the rare few games you'll see that actually impact the world for the better without a single drop of cynicism, snark, sarcasm or exploitation. And that's so increasingly rare. Of course, in the last few months, Kerbal has taken major blows due to Kerbal 2, and that's a crying shame. The full blame solely goes to Take 2, but the earthquake waves have gone beyond that. So I say, don't give up on Kerbal 1, please. But also remember, fuck Take 2. As always, Patreon, links below, good stuff like Discord 2, that's about it. Now I'm off to blow up another oversized monstrosity I call a rocket.